Father, thank you for this privilege of gathering together to worship you. I pray that you bless this time. Give us wisdom. Give us understanding from your word. Lord, be with those who are battling sicknesses and in the church. Lord, just please strengthen them and give them healing as they go through that time. And please let us be faithful to you in everything that we do. And let us grow in you tonight through your word. Let us be built up for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, learning from Christians who went through and lived through intense periods of persecutions and also through the decay of an entire society, I think can be very instructive for us today to learn from such individuals. We can learn how to faithfully stand for Christ amidst a culture, a society, and a nation which is going into absolute and total chaos. One Christian who lived during such a time was Augustine. We'll mention some of his theological thoughts later on when we examine our passage. But he lived during the time of the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, right before the dawning of the 5th century. He, he has written numerous books, which even to this day remain Christian classics. His complete works total roughly around 50 volumes of material. To put that in perspective, the, the great reformer John Knox, he has about six volumes of material. The evangelist George Whitfield has roughly 13 volumes. Jonathan Edwards, the man who many would herald as one of the great minds to ever set foot on North American soil, he has roughly 30 volumes. Martin Luther and John Calvin, two great theologians of the Reformation. They have over 50 volumes. Charles Spurgeon would outpace everyone at roughly 80 volumes of material. But Augustine had about 50. And so we see Luther and Calvin having about the same, and Spurgeon, of course, having 80, a ton of material cranked out over his ministry. But what's the key difference between Spurgeon and Calvin and Luther on the one hand and Augustine on the other? Well, the difference is that Spurgeon and Calvin and Luther all had Augustine's shoulders to stand on as they were going throughout their ministry because they all served after Augustine had lived. Spurgeon fought very highly of Augustine. John Calvin said this. He said, Augustine is so holy within me that if I wish to write a confession of my faith, I could do so with all fullness and satisfaction to myself out of his writings. The greatest theological masterpiece to come out of the Protestant Reformation was John Calvin's Institutes. And in his Institutes, Calvin quotes Augustine once out of every four pages of material. Martin Luther was literally trained and raised up under the influence of Augustine's teachings through his writings. Martin Luther would quote him quite often. And keep in mind that during this time, Luther and Calvin were actually charged with preaching new doctrine. So whenever they said that we are saved through grace alone, by faith alone, and Christ alone, they were charged by the Catholic Church that that was a new idea. And they would point back to Augustine, who had lived several hundred years before them, and say, no, it wasn't. Augustine taught the same thing. Augustine was essentially a giant of a theologian who impacted every single giant theologian, essentially, who came after him. He lived during a tumultuous time when Rome was overthrown. Not only was Rome overthrown during that time, but Christians were actually being blamed for the collapse of the Roman Empire, which is why Augustine wrote The City of God, which would become one of his flagship works. He urged Christians to remember the hope of eternity and to live faithfully for Christ now as they went through that period of trouble. Augustine modeled the preaching of the word, and he fought against all kinds of heresies as he went through this period. He urged Urged Christians on to faithfulness as they fought against the enemies that stood against Christ. And so we wonder, how can we stand ourselves during times of persecution, suffering, and strife? And as we continue on through the book of James, we're going to see how he urges believers to press on during this type of a period. In verses 7 through 9 of chapter 5, read them with me here tonight. 
Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. If we're going to understand this entire passage of Scripture, these three verses, we're first going to have to comprehend and look into what is meant by this phrase, the coming of the Lord. We see that term two times in this passage, once in verse 7 and then yet again in verse 8. The only characteristic that really we are given in this text regarding the coming of the Lord is the fact that it is going to happen quickly. We are told that it is at hand in verse 8. We are told that the judge is standing in at the door in verse 9. Now that phrase regarding the judge standing at the door, it indicates that the coming of the Lord would happen quickly because James is essentially picturing Christ as a judge just about to open the door to enter his courtroom and to convene court. And so narrowing down what the coming of the Lord references has actually caused a fair amount of division over even the most conservative and faithful theologians throughout the history of the church. Some have said that this particular phrase references the final coming of Christ, where he comes to gather his bride and sentence all unbelievers to hell at the final day, at the end of the age. However, the difficulty in maintaining that position is that James says here that the coming of the Lord, it's about to happen. It's at hand. It is imminent in this letter. He's writing to real believers in the year 60 AD, telling them that the coming of Christ is so close that it is literally at hand. And so holding the position that this text is referencing the final coming of the Lord is possible if a person does one of three things, essentially. First of all, someone could believe that James was a false prophet who simply erred in predicting the future. That would be the position held by many liberal theologians and as people who believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. In Orthodox Christianity, no one here is going to hold that viewpoint that James was a false prophet. Secondly, you could say, once again, a view held by liberal theologians, that the covenant of the Lord happened and we just missed it. But I don't think that anyone here is going to argue that we are in heaven right now. And so that position really is not tenable or valid for us either. So we're left with the third option that you're going to have to hold if you're going to say that this refers to the final coming of Christ. And that is to say that when James is talking about this happening quickly, this happening in a short period of time, he, he doesn't really mean that as we would normally understand that in this text. So in other words, and you'll see theologians do this quite frequently, they'll go to Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8, where it says that one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day to God. And then they'll apply that passage to this text in James to say that basically when James says that the day is at hand, he, he's not saying that truthfully. He doesn't really mean that it's going to happen in a short time. But as one of my favorite theologians says, that dog won't hunt. The reason is that when Peter says one day is as a thousand years, and as a thousand years is as one day, he is talking about God being patient towards his church and patiently waiting on the full number of his elect to be saved. If you read that passage, that's what he's talking about in context there. Not only that, but Peter is actually quoting from the Old Testament. The 90th Psalm, verse 4, which says this. That Psalm says, For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, or as a watch in the night. And so what this means is that God views time differently than we do. He is divine, we are human, so we would expect that, of course. But whenever we come to James in chapter 5, do we see anywhere in this passage that James is talking about how God views time? 
No, that's, that's not in this text. He's specifically talking about humans. R- writing to humans in verse 8, he says, You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Notice he is specifically talking to them. The words you and your are prominent in that passage. Humanly speaking, this event that he is talking about It was close. It was about to happen to these believers who lived at the time that James is writing. And so going to 2 Peter, grabbing that text and inserting it into James chapter 5 really isn't a good option either. Though I will admit that that is the way most theologians in our day would handle that particular passage. In fact, many men who I would personally respect would handle this passage in that fashion. But I can't do that because it seems to me that that's inserting something on top of the text that isn't actually here in James chapter 5. So none of those options really work well if we're going to say that James is referring to the final coming of the Lord and still handle Scripture faithfully. However, and this is where I said we were going to get into some ideas by St. Augustine, The man hailed as perhaps the greatest theologian in the history of the church. Many have given him that title. And he gives us some interesting ideas to consider and to mull over in our minds here. Though he's not the only one who holds to these ideas, he's perhaps the most capable who has. In preparation for this sermon, I read a letter by St. Augustine on this subject. You have to appreciate a theologian who writes a letter that is 54 chapters Long. I don't know about you, but I've never written a letter that's 54 chapters. Outside of the final coming of the Lord at the end of the age, Augustine says that there are two other events that we need to be aware of when we see this type of language in Scripture. The first is the coming of the Lord in his church, and the second is the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Let's start there. Modern-day theologians have largely forgotten that the destruction of the temple was actually prophesied by our Lord when he walked on this earth. Very clearly it was. If you turn to Matthew in chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, and you look at verses 1 through 2, with me real quick. Matthew 24, starting in verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And so Christ here was talking about the temple, and he prophesied judgment upon Jerusalem because of their hypocritical religious system developed by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders that had led the people astray. That false system, the temple, would be coming down. And there's also, we have... There's a ton of references regarding this, but looking at another one, if you come to Luke in chapter 23, Luke 23, verses 28 through 30, we read this. Jesus is on his way to the cross. It says, But turning to them, Jesus said, Luke 23, 28, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say, To the mountains fall on us, and to the hills cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? And so Christ, he's on his way to be crucified, and he looks to these women who are literally crying for him, and he tells them, don't cry for me, cry for yourself and for your children, because of the judgment that is coming upon Jerusalem. And so that is the destruction of Jerusalem, which Augustine and many others rightly remind us about. Now, the other area that I said that we need to remember is the fact that Christ comes in his church. For time's sake, I don't want to go into that into a ton of detail, but basically Augustine is reminding us of the fact that Christ comes and strengthens us in our lives to live for his glory. So we might think of the Great Commission, for example, where Christ says that he has all authority in heaven and earth. He urges us that we are to therefore go out and to make disciples, and then he reminds us 
us that he is with us always till the end of the age. That Christ really is present with us in the ministry of his church through his Holy Spirit, through his word. And so whenever we come back to James in chapter 5, the trick for us is to try to figure out which one of these is James talking about in this passage. Well, we already went through the difficulties with thinking that he's referencing the final coming of Christ. So that's really not a valid option. So we're left with either James talking about the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70, or he's talking about Christ's coming and strengthening his church. Well, if you look in this passage, Christ is pictured as what? What is he actually pictured as here in verse 7 through 9? Verse 9, he's pictured as what? A judge. So what does that fit with? That fits much more with the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70, which Christ prophesied where he would bring judgment upon that false religious system. And so that is the clearest way to take this passage, to understand that James is talking about that event where Christ pours out his wrath upon the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, which, by the way, happened about 10 years after he writes this letter. And so that's something that he would say is at hand. Uh, there's no sense in which he's writing this letter and he says the coming of the Lord is at hand. And there's no sense in which it, it makes any coherence to think that happens 2,000 years or so forth later. But 10 years later, yeah, that could be at hand in terms of biblical language. That fits within the context of the passage. And so this means that James is writing to people who are literally getting ready to undergo cataclysmic judgment poured out by God upon idolatrous people, the people of Israel who had strayed from the one true God. They are going to see destruction. They're going to see severe persecution under the reign of the emperor Nero. This persecution would start roughly four years after James would write this letter. Just to give you an idea of the intensity of this persecution, Nero would literally have Christians lit on fire as torches to light his gardens. That's how intense this persecution was. He would wrap them in animal skins and feed Christians to the dogs. He was a horribly wicked man. This persecution was truly one of the most, if not the most intense in the history of the church thus far. And so we could summarize here and essentially say that these Christians were going to have difficult days ahead of them. They were going to face a very trying situation. They were seeing the imminent danger and the massive judgment of God upon sinners. And so what is James going to urge these Christians to do? How are they to respond? I, I don't know about you, but I think that James writing to Christians... Whenever God is getting ready to bring his judgment and they are getting ready to face persecution, I think that's extremely relevant to the current situation that we face in our society. It's like the evangelist Billy Graham once said, and his wife once said, if God doesn't judge America, then he will have to apologize to Sodom and to Gomorrah. Uh, listen, you can't sit here and slaughter 60 million babies and not expect to face the judgment of God being poured out upon that country. So James urges these Christians who are getting ready to face judgment and getting ready to face persecution. He urges them, first of all, to have patience. That's how he opens verse 7. He says, be patient. The idea of the Greek word here, it's specifically tied to the concept of being patient with people. If you look back to verses 1 through 6, of course, you'll remember this morning that we covered how the rich were being oppressive. They were using their wealth simply for their own sinful pleasure. And so James is urging the believers to be patient with the oppressive rich. In other words, we as Christians, we need to be patient with those who would persecute us, oppress us, and demean us. That doesn't mean that we back down from the truth. It also doesn't mean that there's not a time to fight, but it means that we go through these situations with patience. Patience. 
We don't look for revenge. We don't make rash decisions. Instead, we seek to live with wisdom, with skill. We seek the conversion of those who oppress us. We want them to be saved, to find salvation in Christ. This is very much against the nature, against the nature of our sinful flesh, isn't it? If we start out on a 20-year project, our impatience can kick in, making us think that we should have finished it five years ago, doesn't it? But no, James urges patience here in this passage. He gives us the example of the farmer. In the last part of verse 7 through the first part of verse 8, he says this. He says, See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. And so James is giving a very practical example here in this text. They're, co they're told to consider the farmer, and farmers have to be incredibly patient. A farmer goes about his life understanding all kinds of different seasons. He doesn't plant a crop and expect to harvest it two hours later. A farmer understands that there's a time to plant, there's a time to harvest, there's a time to go about all sorts of different duties. There are tasks that must be done in the winter, and there's a completely different set of responsibilities that the farmer has to undertake in the spring and in the summer and in the fall. The farmer has to be patient. He doesn't rush things. He understands that there's a time to plant his crop and then to give that crop a chance to mature and to grow. And so, too, the Christian life must be lived with patience. We're not going to become mature, spiritual, spiritually mature Christians over one day. That process is going to take time for us to grow in the Lord. Growth takes time. Christian growth takes time. Church growth takes time. Family growth takes time. It takes patience to maintain the course over a duration and to maintain faithfulness to Christ. It just doesn't happen overnight. All of this is especially important when we come to the concept of considering suffering as the individuals in James were getting ready to face. Christians have to be patient during those periods, especially. It's vital. The next thing he says is that they need to establish your hearts. When you go through trials, you will need a heart that is deeply rooted and grounded in the truth and in the person of Christ. You, you must not collapse. You must not shrink back. No, you can stand because of the fact that your heart is firmly established in the Lord. That word established is essentially conveying the fact that you are steadfast, you are strong, you are resolute in your ability to live for the Lord. And so James is telling them that you're going to have to be strong in the Lord if you're going to stand in that day. They need to have deep roots, deep convictions in Christ and in Scripture. They need to patiently bear fruit during this time of persecution. And as a side note, this is why superficial, shallow, illegitimate views of Christianity do not hold water during periods of persecution. You have to be grounded in the faith. That is why the depths of biblical truth must be taught and must be mined as we study the Word of God. It is so the church can be established and ready to stand for the glory of Christ throughout life, especially when these trials come. And so how do we establish our hearts as we go throughout our lives? Well, Proverbs chapter 4, verses 25 through 27 tells us, that text says, Let your eyes look directly forward, and your, and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. So how do you establish your heart? You look straight ahead, straight to the path that God has set for us in his word. You don't swerve from it. You don't swerve to the left or to the right, becoming distracted by false ideas, false teaching, or the opinions of the world. You walk in the ways of God. You don't get caught up in the sins of the world. You run to that which is good as defined by holy scripture, and you shun evil at every turn. That's how someone can have their hearts established during times of strife. You run to scripture. You drink deeply of the word of God that is sufficient for us.
Don't just shallowly glance over things. Really take time to know and to study the Bible. And so what is the last thing here that James urges these Christians to do to prepare for this time of judgment and persecution? In verse 9, he says, Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Of course, if you remember, we saw earlier in this letter the fact that James has commanded the church not to engage in silly and selfish quarreling once or twice throughout this epistle. Now he's telling them not to grumble. This is not a disposition that should exist in the church. There is no room in the church of Jesus Christ for grumbling. Uh, there's no room for petty, territorial, uncalled-for disputes in the body of Christ. The reason is that we're all one in the Lord. We're all serving for the same purposes. We're all living on the basis of the same standard. And, and when I say we're all one, I don't just mean everyone here in this building. I mean the church of Jesus Christ across the entire world, that we are all one together, every true believer serving the same Lord and for the same purpose. We're just one of many local churches serving the Lord. True biblical Christians and true biblical churches should be able to work together and to come together to promote the sake of the gospel and the Lord. And so instead of grumbling and complaining during times of persecution, we should be patiently serving Christ patiently serving others, having our hearts established in the Lord. We don't complain against one another. We do not fight against each other. We don't engage in petty squabbles. Grumbling against one another in this way is a mark of those in the world and not a mark of the church of Jesus Christ. Even during times of persecution, isn't that when our attitude could be tempted to grumble the most? It is when the, the world is literally trying to grind us into the dust by pursuing us and persecuting us. Isn't that when we could be tempted to grumble the most? And even in that moment, James says, do not grumble then. So even during intense periods of persecution and suffering, we don't grumble. What do we have to grumble about as Christians? We've been given eternal life in Christ. We've been given the privilege of serving him throughout our entire lives. We have nothing to complain about whatsoever. And so James, he, he just spurs these Christians on, reminding them of these basic truths of biblical Christianity, reminding them that they will be judged if they sin. He says that the judge is standing at the door. The judgment of Christ upon Jerusalem was imminent, as we said earlier. But James has told them the commands of God. He has told them how to stand strong, how to be established. And so whatever difficulties you and I may face in our life, in the years ahead of us, we can see here the principles that God has for us to be ready to stand during that day. We need to be patient. We need to be established in Him firmly. And we need to focus on not complaining or grumbling against God or against each other, but instead faithfully living for him, obediently following the commands of our God. Let's end this time in a word of prayer here tonight. Father, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the privilege of studying this passage of Scripture. I ask that you help us to be firmly rooted in you, that we may bring you glory as we go throughout this life and everything that we do, that we, may be, that we may stand for your truth in a culture and a society that wants to urge us to do everything but that, that we would stand solidly upon your holy word. Help us, empower us as we go throughout this week to live for you, Lord Jesus. And it's in your name I pray. Amen.